for music until, you know, until. Hi and welcome. I'm so excited. I'm meeting today with Dr. Mark Pipes. So I want to say how we, I met, we, we were shooting the Rock Dojo e-course and I was felt so incredibly grateful and blessed to have somebody with your musical experience being part of that film shoot. I'm so, so excited to have you today. And for those that don't know, my name is Brian Parham. I'm the guitar sensei, founder of The Rock Dojo, and I'm sitting down with Mark Pipes. Mark, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, we had such a great time on that shoot. You know, first we had to go find some dojos. I'm going to give a little background. So we, we traveled around Portland during the pandemic looking at dojos, and then we found that that particular guy, um, we called him Master Dan the whole Master time. Dan. And he's amazing. And we just had a great time. It was cold in that building, though, wasn't it? It was really, really cold. I, yes, we should give him a shout out. Super, super shout out to Grandmaster Dan with the Taekwondo studio, studio down in Hollywood. Man, mm -hmm. that was an incredible lo uh, location. And give a shout out as well to GMS who did an incredible job on the uh, the Rock Dojo e-course, which is coming very, very soon. I'm so excited. So anyways, Mark, please tell us, how did you get started with music? Oh my goodness. Well, that's going to take way too long. But, <laughs> you know, my mother was a choir director, and so I didn't have a choice. <laughs> uh, I always sang in church choir. And then even as teenagers, my brother and I were probably the only boys in choir at first. But then we found that to our advantage. It was like, you know, shooting fish in a barrel, finding a girlfriend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we... Uh, I, I sang in choir through through high school and and then I also sang a little bit in um, in college when they were going to go to Europe and I was like I'd like to go to Europe so I, so I joined choir that year but I picked up saxophone along the way um, I started on a clarinet was terrible at it switched over to to saxophone what happened is that I heard a boy play in eighth grade that I and and he was amazing I'm sorry I was in seventh grade he was an eighth grader and I thought he was amazing. And that really inspired me. And then when I went to high school, I sat next to him and he became my mentor. And he would take me to jam sessions. And this is in Delaware and in Wilmington. And then we drive up to Philly. We'd be the only two white kids in the place. And like, it was just, it was an amazing experience. And it was so great to have that, that mentorship. And of course he's still, his name is Rick Hirsch. He's still an arranger and a performer and great musician today and still and still a great mentor and, and friend. And so um, for me, it was all about mentorship and all about meeting people and just having more and more mentors along the way. I studied with uh, Peter Hill at, at University of Delaware. And then I, I really lucked out and I somehow got into Fred Hemke's studio to do my master's at Northwestern. And, um, and that was a great experience. I was like, I felt like the worst player when I got there of the like 30 people that were there. And I probably was, including the freshman. <laughs> and so I just practiced. I practiced like six to eight hours a day. I just practiced, practiced, practiced. Um, the music building for Northwestern is on Lake Michigan. So you just look through a window and you see like the frozen lake. And so that's what you do all winter is just sit there practicing scales. So then I, I've, I've been, for the past 30 years, been a saxophonist, a teacher, um, done a bunch of other things. I love, I love learning about things. So I've, I've, gone and done some other gigs as well so thanks for having me and happy to, to chat about chat with you about music chat about teaching and let's get at it <laughs> well that's amazing you know one of the things that you mentioned that really resonated with me was well two things really first you talked about the choir and i actually started singing um and i'm uh, the worst voice ever i mean i'm absolutely horrible singer but i started taking um singing lessons with ann weiss who does uh, singing for the vocally challenge and wow the way that singing opens up your musical ear, even if you don't want to be a singer. So that's one of the things that, you know, how fortunate and lucky that you were to be part of a choir program. 
for those people that don't know, I, uh, you know, your ability to play a musical instrument is directly related to your ability to hear pitch and to hear rhythm. And so, you know, in, in my personal experience, there's no better way to improve your ability to hear pitch than singing because you start to feel those pitches in your body. It's a great way to learn your intervals. And once you have that advantage, wow, it's such a huge legs up. So that's amazing. And the other thing that you mentioned is community. And that's one of my, my, my biggest, I guess, advocacy issues is, you know, creating a community around music education. And you were so fortunate you said you, you met an eighth grader when you were in seventh grade. That reminds me of uh, Steve Vai and Joe Satriani. I mean, here's two of the world's best guitar players. And it was a, almost the exact situation. I think Joe Satriani was like 14 and Steve Vai was 12. And just imagine how, that. Imagine that combination. It's, in, in it's incredible. It's incredible. And that's the thing is like, before I started teaching and before I learned a musicology uh, instrument, because I came to music super late, I was like everybody else. I thought that it was about talent and certainly talent is, there is a part of it, but I think more important is being part of that community and having those resources. And it sounded like you had an amazing program that you went through in addition to having that, that mentor who was in the eighth grade and helping you walk through the steps. For, for sure. I like to talk about, you know, effort constantly beating talent. <clears throat> It's funny, I've, I've actually taught in an elementary program called Little Mozarts, but I like to use Mozart as an example of what people think is true, but what is actually not true. People think that Mozart just popped out of his mother and could play all this stuff and do all this stuff. That's not true. He uh, was very much coached by his father, kind of like Tiger Woods, like at a, a super young age. And we would might even think of it as child abuse nowadays, where he was just kind of like constantly hammered like over and over and over. And he actually didn't develop well. But anyway, what the, the point is that, yes, there is most people, I haven't met that many people who are tone deaf in, in trying to teach music. I've certainly sung with a couple of people where like I brought a couple of my friends to choir and I heard like, in the background, that's like, oh, okay, yeah, you can't hear pitch. But um that's almost that's that's like the exception to the rule. Most people can hear pitch, and I've heard a bunch of people. Uh, actually, uh, uh, one of the one of my coworkers at GMS, he, he said, "Do you think I'm tone deaf?" And I said, "No, you can you can hum a tune. You just are out of practice." And so a lot of people think, "Oh, I can't do this." Well, I mean, you also can't throw a major league pitch right now, but that doesn't mean if you didn't practice, you couldn't throw really well. You know. Excellent point. Absolutely excellent. And you know, I guess this brings me to the next question, but you, you've already touched on so much of this is, can you tell us about your philosophy as a music educator? Sure. And, and what's really cool for me is I did the doctorate a few years ago, which, you know, I love learning. And every time I take a new class in either how to teach saxophone or how to teach music or, um, or even the, the, the psychology of learning, you know, these, it, this kind of turns your philosophy in different ways. I feel like challenge is the greatest learning tool. And that's backed up by um, some learning science. And you'll notice this when you're teaching. Your students are always drawn to something hard. They're always going to come in and say, can I do this thing or can I do that thing? And it's always something that's like level 10 and they're on level one. And that's okay. You want to use that motivation, right? They always want to do the hard thing. And so you have to scaffold it. What's what you know is you, you build stuff around and help them out. But the best way for them to learn, and, and I'm going to blow smoke up the, the, the skirt of us music teachers, the most effective way for anyone to learn is the journeyman approach with as an, as an apprentice with a mentor. And that's what we're doing. And so imagine instead of them being in a, a class of 35 or 100 or 300, it's one-on-one. -on -one. They get immediate feedback. We challenge them, we help them out. And that's the most effective, the quickest way for them to learn something. Um, it's that zone of development for them that is the highest. Um, and then number two, students have, every student has their own strengths and weaknesses. And I'm not talking about that silly like learning styles thing that is is a myth. What I'm talking about is 
students have like a great ability to transcribe or some students are great at technique or some students uh, really like practicing or some students really like noodling or some students really like playing stuff they heard on TV. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Every, every student is a little bit different, but every student has a blaring weakness as well, right? That doesn't mean they have talent or ability or something. It just means some students have found something that they're good at because they're good at it. This self-efficacy, this, 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 their feeling of self-worth elevates because they think, oh, I can do this and it's good. I'm going to keep doing this. And it makes them motivated to keep doing the thing. So in, in lessons, as you know, you got to, <laughs> you got to be like, okay, let's do the thing. So you feel good. Okay. Let's go over here and do the challenge so we can work on something that's going to really help you. And then of course we have to find that balance of for each student, because it's different for everyone. How much can we challenge during this lesson or, or during the set of lessons? And then how much do we help them feel good with stuff they already know how to do? And I think, um, I think in, inside of that is the problem of, I, I know uh, when I first took piano lessons, it was, it was with, you know, <laughs> here I am in my late forties. I, I call it the old school, like where you know, like, if, if your palms were too low, they'd poke you with a pencil to keep your palms up. Like, yeah, we don't do that with students anymore, right? Like we don't, <laughs> we're very, we're very kind and very nurturing and everything. But um, what happened, what happened, what we found is that students started to feel this perfectionism develop. And, and we still find it even when, even when we're totally, it comes with, from within, even when we're totally positive and, and at least as, as much as we can be they start to look for perfect. And I break that or break through that by saying, hey, let's sound bad right now. What can we do that would sound really bad? Let's do something that sounds terrible. Let's do the thing that we shouldn't do. So like um, I teach saxophone, so let's make a really loud sound. Let's like, let, let's let's work on, for me, it's, we work on overtones. We play the saxophone like a bugle because it sounds incredibly bad, but it also works on certain skills. And to do that, if you know how to make a bad sound, then you're you're exploring that envelope of skill development, of if you're going to sound good, you've got to know where that line is between good and bad. And by the way, it's an art form, so some of that is a blurry line, right? The way to find, the way to kind of beat that, oh, I didn't do it per perfectly, so I don't want to do anything, and I'm going to close into myself, and I don't want to ever perform for anyone, is... Hey, let's just make bad sounds. Let's just make, and let's just have fun with it. So I like to do that. I, I like to make sure that they know that whatever they do, it's, it's, it's appreciated and it's, it's met with, um, this, this developmental like energy, like, okay, let's just do it. Wow. I have um, to say, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. I just wanted to say you, you've given me so many there. You said touch on so many things that resonated. The first being, you know, about the challenge and how students are naturally drawn to challenge. And it's funny because as a guitar instructor, perhaps, you know, the first day a student comes in, it's like, I want to learn stairway to heaven. It's like, okay, the, <laughs> there's a little bit more that goes, it's like saying like, you know, I want to, I want to run in the Olympics right now, but I've never run before, you know? Right. In the saxophone world, it's the, it's the uh, two mini zoos guy. What's that guy's name? The very sax player. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he's, he's pretty well known right now. And he plays great. Um, and, and every, every very sax player, like dyes their hair red now or orange wow. and wants to be that guy. And I'm like, well, slap tonguing is not what we're going to start with. <laughs> <laughs> There's just so much. And then you talked about the second point that you made was about strengths and weaknesses. And I can, as a, a, a from a personal level, you know, we talked about, we talked about singing before, and, you know, I, I, I experienced this myself as a musician starting, you know, I picked up the guitar at like 28 years old and I actually had no clue that pitches went up and down. I didn't, it took me five years before I realized that pitches actually went from low to high. And, uh, but I, but I was really, really, really good at music theory. Music theory was like, which just came so easy to me. And so, you know, one of the things that's fascinating and it goes back to what you were saying is, 
But what may be, some people may not realize is you can actually turn your biggest challenge into your biggest strength. So I personally right. worked on pitch That's right. through, as I mentioned, singing with the vocally challenged with Ann Weiss. And now my biggest weakness, something that took me five or six years to improve is actually my best strength. Now I have this incredible melodicism. I can sit down and improvise and my improvise is a full composition where, you know, melody with question, answer, different, you know, all those things on the spot in real time, because I didn't focus on the thing that came super easy to me, which was music theory. I actually focused on the thing that came the hardest to me. And that was ability to hear pitch. And it's the number one thing that I still work on and related to the ability to hear pitch is of course your melodicism. That's the end goal is as an improviser, I wanna be able to create compelling and moving melodies on the spot. And you can't do that unless you have a really good you know, idea of, you know, okay, where's this note resolve at? Okay, you know, and you gotta hear that in real time. Um, so- yeah, and, and, and have, ahead, you, have you noticed that, have you noticed the stuff you had to work on the hardest is the easiest to teach? Have you noticed that? Ah, oh, that's really interesting. Because you know all those little steps and when your student starts to struggle, you're like, I was there, I know what that is. I'm gonna help you with that. Man, you know, there's so many amazing things. I'm just so grateful because honestly, I feel like I'm learning so much from you right now as an educator. And the third point that you made is like breaking through the need to be perfect. And this is something as somebody, uh, as an educator who teaches improvisation, you know, with the guitar, you learn a few basic shapes. And if you learn, you know, the minor pentatonic scale and pattern number one, you can improvise immediately and begin to write your own riffs. But often, especially when you deal with like uh, students who are in, in your teen, teen, teenage, you know, I mean, you can see, you know, they, that there's that need to be perfect and that right. fear that paralyzes them. And, you know, mm -hmm. just like, it's like seeing somebody at the top of a diving board that doesn't want to mm -hmm. jump into the water because they're afraid, you know? So I love the way that you, that you um, turn that challenge into an opportunity for growth by pushing the envelope and forcing them to sound bad. I mean, that's brilliant, you know, so. I, I have students right now who will put themselves on mute and practice for a second and then unmute themselves and play for me. And I'm, I'm like, what, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you muting yourself? I know how you sound. <laughs> oh no, I don't want to play it like that. I thought, I've already heard it like that. <laughs> and this is phenomenal. So, so my next question for you, um, and this goes back to what we were saying before we hit the record button on this interview is, you know, as somebody who works in the schools, I constantly seeing schools, Portland public schools, you know, closing down various music programs. And uh, I'm curious to know in your thought, what does music have to offer kids today? It offers everything. If the schools, you know, on a, <laughs> here is, here is my, uh, here's my, my latest paper I'm writing. If the schools want to fix themselves, they better check off the arts programs for how to do it. The arts programs have been doing it right for a really long time. And it it's what's real what's really interesting to me is that the the every, every time and I really think this comes from a bit from No Child Left Behind, but a but a mix with some um, conservatism as far as well we must protect math and we must protect writing. I have obviously I don't have any problem with teaching people how to read, write, and do arithmetic and and learn science. I think all of that is incredible. However, you learn how to learn all that stuff by doing the arts. You have to be drawn into learning. And here's why. The arts allows a freshman, and if you're in high school, a freshman and a senior to sit together. What other class does that? My math class doesn't do that. My science class doesn't do that. But in music, I can sit next to a senior and learn from that person. That's pretty amazing. And if you look at the science of it, one of the most effective ways to learn is peer to peer. Peers learn from other peers. What their teacher says is like 20, 25%. What the student next to them says is a whole lot more. So just right there, we already have a classroom where somebody can get a little bit more self-worth, get a little bit more self-confidence, can have some peer to peer interaction just because they're sitting next to them. Second, we have a situation where we have all of these, we're, we're a melting pot culture. And if you're sitting in a classroom that is an art, well, you have a way to celebrate that culture all the time. All we're doing is learning about culture. We're learning about how to empathize. We're learning about how to explore. We're learning about 
how to uh, look at something from a different perspective. You're learning how to learn. That's what the arts do. They give you those skills of how to learn. So if you're in the arts, and it doesn't have to be band, it, it could be it could be choir, it could be visual arts, it could be uh, dance, it could be drama, or something I left out. You're you're literally learning how to be in school, so that when you go into science, you're a little bit less afraid to ask somebody for help because in band class you ask the kid next to you already. In in science class, you're a little bit more likely to think, okay, this word is some word I'm not familiar with, but in music class. There's a whole lot of language that I don't know, but I've learned along the way. So now that I'm in science and I see something I don't understand, I under I've I have now a pathway of how to figure that out. I'm starting to figure out how to learn things because over here in the arts, there's all this crazy stuff that I didn't know about, but I have the confidence now that I can learn it, that I do know. And so, you know, like I said, the and this isn't just Portland, this is this is the whole country. Could look at the arts and say, Hey guys, instead of throwing you in the trash we actually need to put you at the top and ask you, what are we doing wrong? How could we fix ourselves? Because it's not testing, I'll tell you that. It is not testing. Because there's no testing going on in the arts other than performance. And you know what? That brings me to another point. In, in band class, you're only as good as your weakest player. If your weakest player is over there playing the wrong notes, your band's not going to sound as good as it could be. If your math class has some kid failing, doesn't affect the class that doesn't affect the top kid but in band if your jazz band has a drummer who's playing off beat that affects the entire jazz band so what does that mean it means everybody comes together and tries to help everybody else and so learning has starts to have all these other connections to it and we start to work more as a community and because these students start to learn and, and work as a community then they can go into the community outside of school and start to make a effect change that helps everyone and not just their little bubble. So, I mean, I've just touched on a couple little things, but it's not that the art should be saved because we want music or we want nice, or we want something that's nice to look at. Art should be saved so that we can save schools. And I think, you know, a lot of these parallels could be put towards uh, sports and athletics as well, but um, they don't seem to need as much, support it's funny because we we always look to the there, there was a article i just looked at yesterday where a coach was sticking up for the art saying uh because the, the sports were allowed to play during the covid uh restrictions but the arts weren't and the coach said well we need to make sure the arts are doing their thing too and i think that's interesting because um i, I think sports are great but isn't it interesting that the arts are even lower than athletics i mean it's it's the it's it's the thing that's most often ignored and 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 called like well nice to have it's not nice to have it's essential man you just touched upon so many overlapping areas of my philosophy as an educator you know my big philosophy is that the guitar teaches kids the skills they need to succeed on the bandstand, in the classroom, or anywhere else. And I draw, so, as an entrepreneur, I draw so many lessons. I mean, the main thing for, for, for learning a musical instrument is butt in seat. Can you sit down and can you train yourself to practice day in and day out? Can you have a vision? Can you connect that practice to a vision? Can you set regular goals? Are you still holding yourself accountable to those goals? All of those things that that you know not don't only apply to music, but is, can help you be successful in business, especially in today's world where more and more we're all becoming entrepreneurs. We all have to learn how to manage ourselves. And the thing is, like learning a musical instrument, and I can tell you as somebody who was the entrepreneur of the year in Oregon in 2018, it's like there are so many parallels, <laughs> and music is all about 10 times harder. Learning a musical instrument is about 10 times harder than, than doing business. And if you can learn a musical instrument, then you can, and you can succeed at that, man, you can apply those skills to anything else. And I'm in particular, in my experience is the, the world of business, but there's another thing that you talk about. And it's such an amazing point about being a team player. And what you said is, 
not just a fact for the band, if you're in band and you know your weakest player, but also in you know in in business, you're only as good as your weakest teammate. You know, if, if right. you're and the thing is, at a, a certain level, it's not even about you anymore. It's about raising the people up. It's about creating mm -hmm. that perform that culture of high performance and high accountability, and also right. trust. And it's all those things that you're talking about that that students are able to learn. I mean, that was incredible. And, and then the first point you made was the peer to peer. You know, and you were saying that you know, seventy five percent of uh, what we learn, the students learn in school, is actually being done from peer to peer, and just twenty five percent is teacher to peer. So. Um, amazing. And just for, I had a few more questions, but I want to be super respectful of your time. So I'm just going to start to wrap this up. Um, I guess the next question is, oh God, there's really two questions I want to ask you, but I'm trying to be respectful of your time. But one you touched you're, you're on- You're doing great. I okay, great, great. One that you touched on on Instagram, and this is a little bit selfish as a music educator, but I think people will find it interesting. What skills should every musician work on? No matter if they play saxophone, oh. if they play clarinet, or if they play the guitar or even choir, I mean, what are the basic skills that musicians need to develop? Well, I mean, scales, everything is based on scales. And I, I, what I thought was funny, huh, in, in the saxophone world, this is a little niche, right? There is a little bit of a rivalry of sorts between jazz and classical players. Although it doesn't need to be. It's just that sometimes you're putting all your effort into one side. So you, obviously you're going to have this rivalry against the other side. It doesn't matter. We, we, most saxophones learn both styles when, as they should. Um, but as I was teaching the jazz students and I would have them play major scales, they would say, well, I don't, I don't want to learn my major scales. I don't use those in jazz. And I thought, all you do is learn, all you do is use modes of the major scales and then add stuff to that. I mean, sure, you're going to use some other scales. But major scales are the thing. And it, and it's so funny that I'll have pushback from students. I mean, not pushback like I don't want to do it, but pushback from not really practicing it. And then I say, okay, well, let's do, um, let's go ahead and, and start working on uh, some modal jazz. Let's work on Little Sunflower. Let's work on... Sorry, um, let me, sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. Or like, let's work on some Herbie Hancock or something. And I'll say, okay, we're going to use a Dorian mode. And I'll explain to them what that's what it is, and they're like, "Like, yeah, because you haven't learned your major scales yet." <laughs> so it's like you can't build on something that you haven't learned, and so it's always scales, 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 because then everything relates to that. Even if you're not going to use major scales all the time, everything is you at least have a point of reference. But by the way, back to how we learn, we can't learn something if we can't attach it to something. Like if you take in a new piece of information and you can't attach it to something you've already learned. It goes right by you, which is one of the reasons we try to educate people so thoroughly in this country is that um, what's the what's the point of breadth instead of depth? Well, breadth allows you to have depth in some other area because then you have a little bit of knowledge you can stick something to. So so what's the most important thing? Scales, because you can search, you can like attach just about anything um, in music theory to major scales. Um, go ahead. No, I just think it's absolutely amazing what you're saying. And I feel like that's the thing I get the most pushback mm -hmm. from my students as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, why they always want to know why. <laughs> <laughs> because you, and it's hard to explain to them yet because you're like, well, we haven't gotten there yet. You know, I, I grew up on the East Coast and I had never seen a desert, you know, in, until until I drove across the country, which was in my late 20s, I think. Um, you can see it on you can see it in a movie, but until you go to Joshua Tree National Park, you're like, oh, well, this is a thing, you know. So when we take students somewhere, they're they're always kind of like, well, I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we it's I, I think that's a challenge for for us is to always say, well, we know where you're going. You haven't seen it yet. You have to have these skills so that you can survive when we get there. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. I think that. Um... You know, I, I've just gone and, and redid my curriculum and the major scale is a big part of what I'm doing because of what you said, everything is related. If you want to understand harmony, if you under, want to understand how melody works, 
then you need to understand the major scale. You need to understand how you build chords from the major scale. And you also need to be able to hear, you know, where, where it starts and where it ends, your resolution. Right. And then yeah, everything yeah. else, sorry. No, yeah, even, and even if we use a scale that's not the major scale, it relates to it in some way. Just you as have you were some saying. base knowledge. <laughs> Just as you were saying, you know, as you were saying, if you're doing the Dorian, it's the major scale starting on the second, or even if you're learning the minor pentonic, because I do rock, right? So you've got to understand, like, okay, the flat a third, what the heck does that mean? Well, you take right. a major scale and you flat the third, and that gives you the minor. You know right, what I mean. like third of what? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, so... Um, that, second so, thing. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, no, I was no, going to no. say that the second thing, and I, I'm sure you've noticed this, is students will learn to read notes before they can learn read rhythms. And it's that rhythmic learning that I'm, I'm constantly, like making them read something that I know they can't get through yet, but I want them to stumble through it so we can, so that we can work on it because otherwise they learn, they learn rhythms orally, A-A-U-R-A-L, orally. And so they're not really learning how to read it. They're waiting for their friends to play it or for me to play it or for you to play it. And then they'll think, oh, that's what that is. That's okay. But I want them to learn how to count it out for themselves on the page. I want them to understand that relationship. And so um, this happens over and over and over. I'll go into any school and have a sectional with a bunch of saxophonists and they they trip all over the rhythms. And so it doesn't matter if it's jazz or clap or band or whatever. So I think that's a big thing is is let's let's work on something that has a little bit more rhythmic or time, you know, it's in compound meter or it's in something that they're not used to. And let's let's figure it out. Excellent point. I just want to say you can you can make as a musician, you can make incredible music just on mastering a couple of simple concepts. The first one being your basic rhythms. If you can master a whole note, half note, quarter note and eighth note. It's mm -hmm. astonishing, especially with the guitar. If you learn mm -hmm. you combine those four things, which oh, is yeah. really one thing, basic rhythms, right? Basic subdivision. If you can combine that with power chords, you, you can you can have a career on those. So I just want to say how far those simple skills can take a musician. And you were going to say, and I'm sorry, I feel like I cut you off. But have you ever noticed that your students don't care about rests? Like they think rests are some non rhythmic time period that they just chill for. Like I was, so I'll, I'll play duets with students, and you know now we're we're living in Zoom time. But even if I'm sitting next to them, they'll do the same thing which is, well, this rest lasts for, well, I don't know. Well, it kind of lost count. I guess I'll try to figure out where I am now. And I think that's like the thought process <laughs> instead of just counting it because they have actual amounts of time. Um, but I was I was playing this, this Zoom duet. So either I mute myself or my student mutes themselves. So when my students muted, and this is a little side note, it's so they can hear me and model me, um, but I don't know what they're doing, right? And so then I'll have then I'll mute myself and play along with them, and then I do know what they're doing. And what they're doing is getting to a rest and ignoring it and going. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is the thing that makes it cool. That's what you realize. I know. Like when you hear, especially when you hear a big chunky, you know, rhythm guitar part, man, it's usually those rests in there that uh -huh. just oh, that makes it sound so funky. Okay, last question, because, you know, we are two music enthusiasts. We spent our entire lives, you know, you with your PhD, as you were telling me before this, you're also working on a master's degree in music education, you know, and- uh, but I just for, love what, learning. You're still learning, lifelong learning. I, lo I love that. And that's the key, I think, to success at, on the guitar and the saxophone in music or anywhere else. But I guess my question is for like those parents you know, I imagine somebody who's watching this and maybe doesn't know very much about music or doesn't have a lot of experience in music education or maybe never played an instrument themselves. What are like some practical tips that they can use to integrate music into their everyday lives of their families or the everyday lives of their families? Well, listening, obviously, you know, just listen, listen to more music. Um, I, I had a childhood that I didn't realize was special. Um, my parents would take me to the Philadelphia Orchestra when I was a really little kid and I'd fall asleep. Um, and they take me to these musicals and, and I would see these really well, these really great productions of people singing. 
And just out of that, I understood what a voice line should sound like. So then when I started playing, my teacher said, oh, you already get this whole phrasing thing. And I thought, I, I guess I do. But what happened was that I had heard people singing for years and years and years and understood how it was supposed to sound. <clears throat> and I understood the style of it. So it's the same. It doesn't matter what style you're learning. Are you learning jazz? Are you learning funk? Are you learning hip hop? It doesn't matter what it is. got to go listen to it, figure out what they're doing, and then you can insert yourself into that style and, and learn it. It doesn't matter like what you were born as. It matters what you listen to and how you, it affected you and how it how you integrated that. And so listening is something you do anytime you do it in the car, you do it at your dinner. I think it's an excellent point. And what made me think is talent. I heard this, I read this in a book, actually talent is practice in disguise. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is actually a form listening to music is a form of practice. And so mm -hmm. often, you know, this is what the book was arguing. Often when you see a student who you think is incredibly talented, when you do a little bit of the, you know, digging around, mm -hmm. you find, oh, they were in a, a, in, you know, in an environment. And you talked about two things, really. You talked about listening and you talked about going to see the Phil Philharmonic. And you mm -hmm. talked about at the beginning of this interview, you know, being part of the choir and having a friend at an early age. So, mm -hmm. you know, all of these are forms of practice in disguise. Right, right. Having, a, that's another great thing is just either doing stuff with your, if you're a parent, doing stuff with the kids or allowing your, your kids to go and hang out with other friends who are also doing musical instruments and just trying things. That is a lot to be said. There's a lot to be said for the garage band. You're just trying things out. And I, and I like that. Again, the search for perfection is not where we're going. We're going for trying this out. How does this work? And when we want to fill in the gaps, we go get help. We go get a mentor. Fantastic. All right. Well, where can people learn more about your work? My website is markpipes.com, just like just like my name. Um, and, and you can find me there. And also on Instagram, I'm Dr. Pipes. <laughs> My my friend named my Instagram site before I did the doctor. Anyway, it's D-O-C-T-A pipes. And I'm going to start doing some micro lessons. I'm going to start doing some 30 to, to 60 second tiny little lessons just on like little, little things just because I feel like here's the things I repeat in every lesson. What if I made little Instagram things about them when I <laughs> Be like, here's here's what we're doing. I don't need to, I don't need anybody to pay me for this because I do it so often. <laughs> well, Doctor Pipes, I have to say I am so incredibly grateful for your time today. I've this honestly I've learned so much, and there's you've given you know people watching this so much depth, and I just feel it's such so spoiled. I mean, I'm I'm like inspired to go and. And, and take some of the things that you talked about in the beginning to apply it to my music lessons. So I'm thanks, Brian. You know, right now when everyone is trying to kind of just either stay home or not be as social, I think this type of stuff is super great. I, I really enjoy speaking to you and we can do it as much as you want, you know, and maybe we'll get some whiskey out. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ever want to interview me for, for on your end, I'd be happy to do it. And I just great. want to say, man, honestly, this has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate it. Awesome. You have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Oh, and you know what? I got to give you credit. Every master was once a beginner. The That's more right. you practice the better you will become. I just have to end this by saying, you threw my students for a loop with that one. <laughs> He's been watching their minds explode because for years I've been saying, the more you practice, the better you get, the better you get, the more you practice. So it's been hilarious at the end of every Zoom call. Now I say, <laughs> I'm sorry, but you just gotta imagine this. I say, every master was once a beginner and then their brain and they start going, the more you practice, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see this moment, but I have to say, I like yours better and I'm going with that. And I've been so entertained every day on Zoom watching my, you know, my students stumble through that as they're getting used to the new saying. I don't remember who I stole that from, but it is great. <laughs> it is great. So thank you so much, man. You rock Dr. Pipes. Thank you. You thank as well, you. Brian. Bye-bye.